Before beginning this segment of the Sonya Retrospective, I'd like to take a brief moment to acknowledge certain assets revealed for the MKX mobile game immediately after this was recorded. I encourage those of you who listen on our YouTube channel to take a close look at the screen now, and I invite those who listen by other means to take a brief moment to do the same at their earliest opportunity, whenever feasible. Right about now. See this? You're seeing it, aren't you? Jesus Christ, how horrifying. So, now's about the time when we move into the modern era of Mortal Kombat. Now's the time when we follow Sonya Blade into Outworld in a fresh new rebooted era. It sure is. I was, because, um, hmm? because we didn't just spend the past eight games with her chasing Kano. So let's let's make another game where we go right back to the beginning and have her chase Kano. <laughs> Fun fact, I was looking up uh, the script on GameFAQs and uh, just to refresh us about what happened to her at the end of Armageddon. According to that script, at the very least... She's one of the lucky ones, along with Cabal, who gets a vulture feasting on her guts. And that's the last we see of Sony in the original timeline. That is, uh, that's unfortunate. It is. It really is. We should, we should mention how she got to that point. There is that little bit in the Armageddon uh, intro where, as she's running up the pyramid, Johnny just kind of nudges her sideways and she goes flying. <laughs> right, there was that, yeah. I think a lot of people had problems with that. Because I, I guess, you know, we assume that, or we have to assume that the allure of Blaze's power kind of overwhelms any kind yeah, of common yeah, sense. Yeah, they were trying to push this idea that Blaze, like, draws people to him, quote-unquote, like a moth to a flame. Something that he's like got that. some kind of compulsion effect that makes people want to climb the pyramid and tell everybody else to fuck off and be the first one there. <laughs> Johnny wouldn't do that to her. <laughs> He's actually rather a gentleman when it comes to Sonya, as we're going to see when we get into MK9. I mean, I mean, it is worth pointing out that other than that Deadly Alliance poster, which I'm sure he designed, where she's hanging on his leg like the poster for Army of Darkness, Hmm. There's really no indication in the old timeline of a relationship between the two. Like, it's... MK9 is the first game that hooks them up. Like, in the movie. I do believe that the writers were using the opportunity that a reboot offered to re-examine all the old fan theories and pairings. Yeah, I mean... And it, it's, 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 it's something it's that the they wanted to make thing... retroactively happen. It's one of the very few things that they did that I would actually have wanted a reboot to do. Yeah. Like, like that's the kind of thing that should exist in every timeline. But it wasn't at all something that crossed my mind before the first MK movie came out. But once it happened, there was no going back. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's the thing. Like, the movie the movie dropped in 95. It was early enough in the franchise that, like, you can't go... You can't look at it the way a lot of movies are, where it's like, they completely got it wrong. It's more like they invented all the stuff. <laughs> they struck on something. They saw potential connections between characters, and in this particular scenario, they really got it right. Yeah. And honestly, like, Sonya and Johnny both kind of need it. They like, do. they're very, they're kind of dry and one-dimensional. So, like, the more character relationships you connect to them, the better they are. Without each other, they kind of always seem to add up to Liu Kang's sidekicks. Yeah. Just well, be I mean, The thing sometimes. about writing is... A lot of characters, if they existed alone in a vacuum, wouldn't be very interesting. What makes a character a character is how they connect as puzzle to pieces people. to all the other characters. Right. And that's not just a Mortal Kombat thing. That's, that's like fiction. That's that, that's yeah. Writing. Like people need relationships, <laughs> and 
And I'm not saying they have to be romantic ones. People just need relationships with other people, like and allies and enemies, and yes, sometimes romantic. <laughs> Even if all the relationships are terrible, you can have a wonderful character defined by those relationships, those terrible relationships. Even if their life is nothing but abuse. Looking at you, Reptile. <laughs> Looking at you. <laughs> Uh, the new timeline's kind of working out for Reptile. He finally has a job where his boss doesn't hate him. <laughs> it's been so lovely to him. So, we hop into MK9, and Sonya is basically there to do the things Sonya's always done. We don't get she's, the motorcycle she's chase She's there to this Sonya. Time. Yeah. She is but, there um, to Sonya. <laughs> there is kind Press of... Press X to Sonya. <laughs> Just... Be professional about your revenge. That's that's the Sonya motto. Well, they, no, not this they, one. They did, this one. <laughs> they did add an aspect to their hate boners for each other because they specify that Kano in this version of the timeline was an informant for the special forces. Yeah, so but here's... Surprise, he was really their leader. Yeah. Here's the thing about that. Like, in the old timeline... When Su Hao was introduced, his backstory was that before he joined the OIA, he had spent years uh, pretending to be a Chinese military policeman who would give the special forces intel and help them catch the Black Dragons. Right. So, so they have erased Su Hao by giving Kano his backstory. Well, that's... You can infer except, that. Except flipped it, because now the informant is leading them away from the Black Dragons, so that in this timeline, the Black Dragons aren't, like, going extinct like they were in MK1 through 4. You could infer that they're erasing Su Hao by doing this, but I don't think I particularly care to unless I have hard evidence that that time period has passed without mention of the character whatsoever. Well, you can't, you can't have two informants giving contradicting information... Because, believe, like, I, Su Hao would know Kano. It's, <laughs> His it's job is to out the Black Dragons. <laughs> a lot of time passes. It's, it's, it's possible, I think, that Su Hao comes later on. Like, I believe mm, I'm, in, in, in somewhere, in, like, the space of MK4 to Deadly Alliance, th there's a lot of time there. Th there's a couple of years. There's a lot of room to work with. I don't, I re no, see, I think Su Hao is supposed to be before MK1, because... Because hunting the Black Dragons, plural, mostly takes place before MK1. Like, it's Kano leaving for the tournament that causes the downfall. You could angle so like, angles to this, though. You could say that maybe Su Hao There was really no Black Dragon to catch between MK1 and MK4, except Jarek. <laughs> well, you could say that Su Hao is maybe the one who outs Kano, the Special Forces. I just... I'm personally against assuming someone is out because someone else has well, a similar bit of plot. I mean, the other thing is, is, like, in the old timeline, him being an informant led to him joining Sonya and Jax's team when they formed the OIA. But in the new timeline, like, I mean, if you treat the comic as canon, then obviously Su Hao is working openly for the Red Dragons when Kenshi is a mole for in them... So it's like he's obviously not with the special forces. Well, I don't. That, I don't think the Su Hao informant that, thing happened. That could put him earlier on in the it's, new timeline. It's possible. But I just, I just think it's funny that their answer to give Kano more stuff was to give him Su Hao's stuff, because Su Hao's stuff wasn't good enough for Su Hao to be interesting. <laughs> I mean, no lies detected. Sorry, Chrome. I mean, I like Su Hao. I think he could be improved a lot. The problem is his look and his gameplay, not so much his story. But, like, it's not helping Kano. He's the same character. Nobody really noticed except, like, me. <laughs> if Su Hao had emerged in a different time, if, if Su Hao had emerged these days, with the, the same backstory that he had, the a couple of different variations on the special moves he had with you know, wrestling... It's it's possible. He like might, I keep, I keep he, saying he it, just, if he was introduced now, he'd basically be an Asian-looking Bane. He he, you know, function like Bane with the powering up, the glowy veins to get stronger, and all that. Like 
I think that's what he would be, and I think people would take to him a lot more because he wouldn't just be this goofy looking bald guy with a funny little mustache whose moves are just awful. <laughs> I'm gonna be really honest about this. You introduce a shirtless guy with a policeman's cap, and you have his default pose be jazz hands, and you present this to the average Mortal Kombat fan base. Sorry, kids. And they're gonna come away with some stereotypes, because I... I was there when Stu Howe was released on, on, the, on MKCombat.org, yeah. and yeah. the gay cop village person jokes were just everywhere. But look at us. We're, we're investigating the how again. We should get back to Sonya. It's true. In in MK9, they specify that she does have a personal interest in taking Kano down because she feels directly responsible for bringing him in as an informant. And so when he got her team killed chasing the Black Dragons, she takes it as her fault. And she's like, Kano tricked me and used me, and so I hate him. Which, to be fair, is a bit more involved than... He killed my partner, if that's even a thing that we've covered. I mean, in this version, she could have still had a partner, but he might I have think been she part of that. Specify that Maybe. as opposed to like he killed my team. Like, if there was Raising one the guy on the team she was closer to than the rest, it would come up. I think in dialogue. Maybe. This is a case of I think that they had every opportunity to say whether. It was a partner or it was a fiance. The fact that they said it was my team. Yeah. It's the singular it's individual's choice. been yeah. The 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 single individual's yeah. been washed back into the mists of the past. I mean, I I kind of personally prefer if it was like a a partner or lover because then it's sort of why she's so cold to Johnny and hard to like make to get close to people is if it was someone close to her that died would yeah. work for me a little bit better we were talking about this before we went on the air briefly but uh, not a lot of uh, the good guys tend to have personal revenge stories she did something extra to go into the tournament to go into Outworld with and Johnny's got his shtick about proving that he's the real deal again with uh, the MK9 yeah. reboot. And Liu Kang's always I been just... Liu Kang. He's always had his reasons. But Sonya's... Sonya needs more to keep her going than just I want Kano. Well, it's for me... For me, it's not enough just to give a character an origin story that says why they're there. Like, an origin story should explain personality traits. The origin should be the origin of why they act the way they act. Yeah. But, um... The other thing about um, Sonya in MK9, and the most interesting thing to me, is that they tried to give her uh, more characterization in her bio and ending that never once comes up in story mode. Which is... Okay, so it was already established way back in the uh, MK1 bios that her dad was also military. So you can assume, okay, she grew up an army brat and that's why she went into it. Major Herman Blood. Um, yes. But MK9 specifically says that her dad went MIA while investigating the Black Dragons. So that's, that's not just her motive for joining the army was to be like her dad. It's that she specifically wanted to go after the Black Dragons and find out what happened to her dad. And then in her ending, her ending says that like after the invasion is over... Because, like, Jax and her friends, like, a whole bunch of people died, and she's got, like, bad PTSD from it. She, like, she's so distraught that she quits the army. And she decides to, like, hop on a motorcycle and drive around hunting, like, outworld invaders that are still stuck on Earth. And the ghost of her father, or a spirit claiming to be the ghost of her father like, appears to her and follows her around on her mission. And it's like, so either you're implying she's gone crazy, she's being tricked by something pretending to be her dad, or, and here's the interesting thing to me, what if her dad was actually connected to the supernatural 
and that's his cause of death and why he's now like helping her in this ending and it's like yeah what if, what if her dad knew raiden and was like an ally of the white lotus society or, or something like that but but they don't do anything with it in story mode or in mkx so i guess it doesn't matter <laughs> getting major uh garland briggs twin peaks vibes here the guy who knows everything and it's all top secret and he can't actually talk about it, and then one day he just vanishes and then he's a disembodied <laughs> head offering cryptic advice but it is a place that i wanted her to go to among the mk9 endings i was actually pleased to see that they were taking this angle that was very far away from your typical black dragon involvement assumedly and giving her another reason to stick around because like we've covered she can't stick on kano forever yeah, I just like the... So, the thing about Sonya is, as we talked about before, is that, like, she's she goes into the MK1 tournament as a character who doesn't have superpowers yet. So, it's like, her story is, okay, she is there because she's one of the world's strongest fighters. Shang Tsung was obligated to trick her to be in the tournament because she fits the tournament criteria. But, but her whole thing is she hasn't realized her potential yet. Like, she's a... She's a chosen one who hasn't gotten the... Tr so, that's what's interesting to me is, like... Where does that potential come from? Because, like, so many of the characters in Mortal Kombat have this backstory of, like, magic and why they have it. Like, you know, Liu Kang trained with, you know, these guys who believe in chi and that martial arts are spiritual to them. So that's how he learns to manifest, you know, these powers. And Johnny Cage has, you know, magic ancestors and Sub-Zero has magic ancestors. And it's like, well, if Sonya has potential and she just hasn't unlocked it yet, where does it come from? I'd rather she didn't have any magic ancestors, to be very frank about it. Just no, I'm not. I'm not Eva. saying magic ancestors. I just think it would be like. I, I guess would, it kind of. I is have magic no ancestors, problems, but it's more subtle to go like, well, some people like. This is a shitty example, but midi chlorians. <laughs> nah, see, I have no problems with there being a Batman, a much well, yeah, roster of the MK characters. Sonya's not the Batman. Like Striker is a Batman because uh, he does just use tools. Sonya she... can potentially be magic. Like she has, she learns lose bike kick. She has the kiss of death fire. I there's. I'd rather take that as her being just that good. I really would. I feel like I just I want there to be something in Mortal Kombat that says people that are that good are that good for a reason that. A normal human being cannot fly. So there are some human beings who can fly, and it's like, well, what is that? I feel like you've got to, you know, if you're going to do that, you've got to actually make it amount to something, make it worth something. We got payoff for Johnny's Mediterranean ancestry, which is a, a great thing. And yeah, but I just, I, I just feel the like fact that like Smoke and Cyrax is supposed to sector capable depending on your continuity of escaping that cybernetic body of theirs because especially as in smoke's case there's still something inside there there's something strong in there and to me i guess well yeah smoke, smoke's whole thing was that well smoke's thing was supposed to be the power of friendship was what broke him out of it like he he was you know he had a best friend who could talk him into recovering his memories and will powering out of it whereas cyrax was just a mook and didn't have a connection to anybody and therefore didn't get broken out until the special forces reprogrammed him. See, I look at it like this. Raiden's got these chosen ones, right, for MK3? And Smoke's up yeah. there too. Yeah. And the way I kind of look at it is like, assuming that somehow you'd have, forgive me for what I'm about to say here, but like, Cyber Sonia, you probably would have gotten the same result. As in, the essence of so, her, her soul is just that strong that it would naturally rebel against the programming. So that's that to me is the something special. She doesn't necessarily need to oh. have like an, an ancestry or a special power, but it's just the fact that they are who they are. That's why she's up there with these people. That she can do this. Stuff. So your argument for chosen one status is sheer force of will. 
force of will, strength of soul, smiled down upon by the gods, whatever you want to call it. I just don't think that you need to have an ingrained ability or an ancestry. I don't think that you should necessarily have to be special because, I mean, st according to this criteria, Striker special, and yeah, like like we said, like we're just saying, he's he's got nightsticks, he's got grenades, and you know, he's kind of living proof that you don't have to have something special about you or be spiritual or have combat training even specifically to be part of Raiden's Chosen. To be I mean that's that fair. Special. I just think So I feel like my argument would be that Striker must have done something to prove himself in the early moments of the invasion where Raiden went, that guy's a good enough fighter, I'm gonna make sure that he gets the protection when people are being saved from the soul wipe. But, like, Stryker wasn't invited to the tournament, you know? <laughs> That's- I just want- I just want something for the MK1 characters to go, like, what is it about these people in particular? So there's, like, tiers of special to you. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not... I, I'm not saying I want her dad to have had powers. I just want him to have been someone who was maybe aware of the bigger world. Okay, that's fair. But, you know, just no hidden rituals on babies either, because Tomas Verbata had that too. No, no, yeah, like, <laughs> that's, that is one thing I like, like... Most people have very different origin stories. Like, it's not like they're all just X-Men. <laughs> like, I like that Smoke, like, his origin is, well, he's actually a, a demon because this guy got sacrificed and came back from the dead with demon powers. And, like, and some guys were actually, like, born with magic because of their ancestors or whatever. But like, so I guess that like what would be optimal here is kind of a difference between Stryker's upbringing, whatever that happens to be, and Sonya's. Yeah, like I think I think Stryker I think Stryker especially works better the more just a normal guy he is. It is his thing, yes. But I just I just think it would be interesting if Sonya's dad was like he secretly had like Nick Fury intel. <laughs> I got no problem with that. I just don't want any spells cast on her to give her, like, an edge over everyone else. Because that's... We're already there, you know? We're, we're already yeah, no, like, I, I don't... I wouldn't want to change her special moves at this point. Like, I don't need to see her now throwing the Kiss of Death as a move. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, shooting fireballs, but... Oh, God, that'd be terrible. Like, she can keep the rings as a laser thing. Especially, and here's here's the problem with it is that MKX is 22 years after MK9, so it's now much too late to start delving into her dead dad. It's they passed that point. No, it's never. It's, it's 50 never years old is not when you start unlocking your secret potential. <laughs> it's the kind of thing that they, if they were going to actually go into any kind of detail about it, they probably would have in MKX's ending. And if memory serves, yeah. they well, that's... didn't. I'm going to review that. Well, while we're talking. we can talk about. There is something in her MKX ending that we can get to, but we should finish up on nine first. So let's talk we about should. um. Uh, I costumes do... because well, that's hang uh. On. Before we get actually into costumes, since we're talking about like her personality okay. and what in MK9, there's a moment there that happens in the script. Okay. That um, we were talking about how her problem is that she's essentially resting bitch face the character 90% of the time. <laughs> this is true. And I think that with a lot of the characters, MK9 and, and 10, have attempted to give us a bit more to them and explore them a little bit and show us different facets of the personality. And I would, I would argue that X doubled down on resting bitch face the character. It did. But we can get to that. It later. did. <laughs> the thing is about that... That was a part of her, and it was examined as a character flaw that prevented her from getting to know her family. So that's true. Made, that's true. They did. They they made use of it. But we'll get to that because what I want to talk about first, briefly, is a little moment that happens in MK Nine Story Mode. Um, 
after her and Johnny first come to blows, and he's like, well, I can't let you walk around without a guard, and she's like, well, fuck off, you know? I don't need your goddamn help, which is an understandable response, and... Yeah, he's, then... he's like... He's being a huge dick, but pretending to be chivalrous. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because this is just who he is at this point in time. He's like, anything that'll get me that foot in the door so that I can ask for a first date. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and at this point, Kano kind of ambushes them. He knocks her down, and she's like down for the count, and he's like creeping up on her. And then Johnny gets back up. And he kicks Kano's ass. He actually comes to her rescue, as horrible as that is to admit. And that's how they wrote it. It's yeah. it's not a great scene. It's, it's clumsy a little bit, but the thing is, there's a little detail in that where, like, he tried to offer her his hand before and she, like, shut him down. And, like, after the Kano thing happens, she lets him help her up. That's true. It's like... a moment. It's... It's the very first and the very early acknowledgement that there's something there. It's a tiny moment. Like, the thing is, Sonya is not a bitch for the rest of the game, yeah. once you get to that point. Like, that... Like, they introduce the bitchiness early, and then they soften her up and just have her be, like, a regular character. The other thing is, that scene was... That scene is like the start of her chapter. So then she has her four fights. And then she fades into the background of the game. <laughs> yes. It's not perfect. She doesn't have a full exploration, but I feel like this is them trying to give us a little bit more to her. I don't think I don't think MK9 did anything wrong with Sonya. But you don't think it it's did a lot. It's just exhausting it to see it for the third time in my life, over and over and over again. Yes. Fourth time? Maybe. Let me think. Uh, MK1, the movie, Shaolin Monks, 9. So yeah, four times I've seen this same story arc. <laughs> I guess in the interim we move over to the MKX comic. That's just kind of a prequel. And here we begin to examine a little bit more of the relationship between her and Johnny... Well, yeah, here's here's the thing about... So the comic starts with uh, Cassie's, like, 15 years old. Sony and Johnny are already separated and living in... You know, Sonya lives on the army base and he lives in his apartment. And Cassie apparently is supposed to be living with Sonya, but often leaves to go to her dad's house. Her bio um, is that essentially, because she's such a career, a career woman and... She's a, and she is emotionally distant, and this is why her and Johnny divorced. Yeah. So yeah. Johnny was the, the dad. The thing is, Sonia was not a over good the house. course of the comic. They reconcile, and Sonia like opens up, and like there's this one particular issue where her and Johnny are alone for the whole time on like a boat, sailing with Kotal Khan to Shangzong's Island yes. because. Havoc and Reiko have kidnapped Cassie and they're going to rescue her. So they spend That's the whole issue scene. on a boat in the, their cabin together and Sonya tells this story about how this one time she went to rescue Kenshi from an ambush and there she it was in the Middle East and there was like a woman who was gonna, like a Middle Eastern woman who was gonna shoot a rocket launcher at her and the Middle Eastern woman had her child right there and Sonya... And she had to drop her. Yeah, had to shoot, like, couldn't hesitate, but felt super bad about killing this woman in front of her kid. And how she relates it to her own relationship with Cassie and how bad she feels about always being away from home for work. And it it was a nice moment, and, it you know, her and Johnny reconnect. But then we start MKX five years later, and we're right back to square one. They're separated, and they do the same thing again in MKX. It's not Sean Kittleson's fault, and I, I brought up the comic because I wanted to give him kudos for that, because it was a moment of Sonya letting it go I think a little bit, and it was really welcome for me to say. Go the on. message of it for me, it's not like a bad thing, like, I don't like seeing a character arc repeated on a loop forever. 
But at the same time, I feel like there is a valid message here that some people just don't change. That Sonya is always going to be Sonya. It can work. She can have that moment of honesty and openness and a heart to heart. And then the next day she gets up. Oh, God, what was I thinking? And then she just goes back to who she is. Yeah, it's like at, at the end of the day, her and Johnny are never going to be a happy couple. It is one of the things that like, I'm very curious about for the future. She's not the kind of person to be in a relationship and make it work. Like, As time goes on, they're, they, they are totally going to have the Spider-Man conversations about her needing to stop what she's doing before her job gets her killed. God damn it, Tiger. Please come home safe. <laughs> I, just, I wanted to bring that up, and it's... A nice little glimpse into their chemistry and the fact that Cassie was apparently conceived during celebrations at the fact that Shao Kahn was dead. They partied a little bit, and they partied hard. I will say, Sonya is extremely spry-looking for a near 50-year-old in MKX. <laughs> I mean, in a universe that has Sindel... Is the presence of so yes, hot but Sindel story. has an excuse. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, MK is Cougar Country. So, I just they could have put a little gray in her hair. I don't know. <laughs> they could have done more than nothing. Know, <laughs> it's it's not it just media aimed at kids and the, and I, so Sonya has fighting fighting games. It is really hard to find a fighter with a kick-ass senior, senior citizen character who is also female. It's hard to find okay, so ass-kicking grannies. Here's here's or my argument. Verging on that, everyone's got to be beautiful. Sonya has Sonya has three costumes in the game, yeah. at least four if you count the stupid Russian one. Um, only one of them is her present day look. So, there's, like, if you have to have, like, the hot outfit, you could just pull a Liu Kang and have her primary be her tournament costume. <laughs> and then, and then put a little gray, just, like, a little bit. Like, Johnny has a little bit of gray. He looks good. They're afraid of the kids going, I don't want to play as an old woman. And that's all there is to it. And it's <sighs> fucking stupid. I... So Sonya's not even attractive enough in MKX to be, like, to have attractiveness be her selling point at this point. I have, now that we come to it, I have Like, never, she's not ever, the hot one anymore. <laughs> I've never really seen Sonya as the hot one. Well, you see, you've got, you got Carrie Hoskins, and you've got the movie. And that's, that's it for hot Sonyas to me. But I can see people seeing Sonya as the hot one. The thing is, I don't really like blondes, but there are obviously a lot of people who do. I just always saw her as a butt-kicking character first. Uh, never waifu material to me. Sorry. just She's a person I would like to go out and have a beer with after a job well done. That's it. Well, that's, it. that's the resting bitch face for you. That's what's doing that. <sighs> <laughs> Honestly, like, I think when every she... time you look at a woman, she looks like she bit into a lemon. You're probably not not thinking about a relationship. <laughs> Honestly, I think Sonya's a gin girl. She wouldn't want beer. Johnny strikes me as a, as a beer guy. Sonya, yeah. gin. Strong, <laughs> strong mixed drinks, and she'll drink you over the table with shots. Beers yeah, for... I think because I think, because I think for Sonya. When I imagine Sonya drinking, it's straight whiskey. Yes. Pussies with their beer. Anyway. Because she's the I've got something to prove kind of woman. She's like, I can drink you under the table. What's the, totally. what's the hardest shit you totally. have? <laughs> scotchy, scotch, scotch, scotch. So, alright. We've covered the MKX comic and a uh, nice little depiction. So we've, so we move into MKX. And like we were saying here... Well, do we want to talk about I mean, we've kind of glossed over the costume issue, because it was an issue in MK9. Like, 
Okay, yeah. It was a problem. controversy. <laughs> I just figured we would get to the costumes one, starting from like the start to the end. After we did MKX, because this is... There's not too much to talk about in terms of her MKX characterization, but there's enough. Fair enough. So we, so we move into MKX, and here's where the resting bitch face characterization finally kind of pays off a little bit, because as we said, it's a crucial part of her story, such as it is. There's not much of Sony that we do get, but she does get a little bit of closure, I like to think. Because for the first time in God knows how long, we actually we get to see her have another round with Kano as like they identify him in the crowd scene. And That's she gets true. To, they... Yeah. She gets to go up to him and pummel him into oblivion. Although <laughs> I wanna say we'll get to pummeling in a second, but she's finally got him where she wants him. And you know, you've got you've got that usual scene of her allies talking her down and telling her not to kill him, despite the fact that she obviously wants to, and she finally arrests him. And she sends him away. And it's... That is, that is one of the most satisfying parts of MKX for me, just because... finally. Yeah, you know? And after just that... Let it be over now. Whatever, and this, yeah. this is why whatever I keep happens arguing to not bring... This is why I keep arguing to not bring Kano back, because I like Kano, but the moment he comes back, you're undoing that scene. The story doesn't need to be told again. We've had we've had a timeline where they had their final confrontation and she thought he was dead for 20 odd years or whatever. Hell, the like I was, was, I was actually pretty salty. Like one of the many things that I don't like about MK9 is that Sonya only fights Kano at the tournament, and they never have a rematch. Yeah. And this here, this is satisfying, like you said. And in the future, they don't need to revisit this. This should be the end of it, and because her. Not killing Kano exhibits a lot of personal growth. It's a great moment for her. And I'm happy. I was really happy. And she also gets to do the most wonderful thing to Quan Chi. <laughs> Sonya becomes the vehicle for which my hatred of that tennis ball faced prick is delivered. <laughs> I have never beheld a quick time event so eminently satisfying as pressing a button to grind Quan Chi's junk into dust. <laughs> the look on his face as he just shakes his head no. And she there nods are... sadly. Yeah. There are a lot of people and I mean, like, not just in our little corner of the fan base, all the people who didn't like how much bullshit Quan Chi pulled at 9, who were super satisfied with that, but, like, you look in, like, the YouTube responses to, like, story mode videos, a lot of people were really happy to watch Sonya stomp Quan Chi in the nuts. <laughs> it was just so fucking... Hel it was hilarious, it was everything I've ever wanted and you know whoever says Sonya doesn't have shit to do in MKX ah eat my nuts she did plenty I, I like that I like that it wasn't even really I mean it was a little personal because she was saving Johnny but that was the first place her mind went to to answer the question we need to break his concentration so I can spell he cast. <laughs> I know. Some, I'll go for the nuts. <laughs> some weaknesses are universal. No one's focusing on anything else but their ground up balls after that happens to them. So, the story of Sonya in MKX is a story of satisfaction. She's not the most present person, but it's nice. If all she had had to do was just be 
put in danger <laughs> so Johnny could have his green flash moment at the start of the game, I'd be very upset. But they give her enough to work with. Sonia is one of the... Um... I mean, aside from that one scene in the beginning of Nine where Johnny's being a jerk and it's not, it's cl so clumsily lit written because, like, he gets to win the fight where she hits him for hitting on her. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, other than that moment, I would say Sonya is, well, I guess, I mean, she has to be rescued in MK2, but, okay, so other than those two moments, of all the, like, lead females in Mortal Kombat, Sonya has the most agency and is the most quote-unquote strong female character. No, in a definitely. good way. Like, like so often that can be, like, a cliche where it's just poorly written. Sonya is actually, like, a person who does stuff for herself and it works. I've never thought damsel in distress yeah. when I've looked at Sonya. When she's been captured, she's been captured alongside Kano. Johnny got, you know, webbed up and had a bunch of burrowing insects attached to his face. Johnny's <laughs> been damseled more than Sonya has. I mean, look, sometimes people do get captured or incapacitated it's, and need help. That's, that's just a storytelling technique. She's never been exploited as a character to serve that role over and over and over again. Yeah, no. She's in the the games have never given her that why did Shang Tsung put you in a dress moment. There was that. <laughs> there was that, but that was like this Hollywood turn that the film I suppose it is I suppose it is a, Katana, it film. Katana has a thousand why did Shang put you in a dress moments. Yes. They have thoroughly shit on that character like and Sonya remains strong. And as it's a Katana fan, it's really unfair. <laughs> the movie is the movie, and I suppose I can forgive it that one little thing, because it did so much else right. Oh, well. It also gave us the only time she ever actually murdered Kato. That's true. It didn't happen in the novelization version. Like, Liu Kang talks her out of snapping his neck, because he's like, that's what Shang wants you to do. Mm -hmm. Oh, speaking of the novelization... One of, I think that perhaps my favorite scene that didn't make it into the movie that was, I think, also in the original script is in the novelization. Mm. They're having uh, the tournament rounds. And this is Sonya's first one. And her opponent is Jade. Oh, right. Yeah. This is how Jade shows up in the MK1 movie novelization. You know... Sonya, like, <sighs> reads her, looks in her eyes, and Sonya takes this gigantic bow... With, like her eyes closed. And so Jade, thinking this is an Earthrealm custom before every fight, does the exact same thing, which is when Sonya punts her in the face as she's bowing. <laughs> Flawless <laughs> victory. And she just walks off like, idiot. And that was it. That was the story of Jade in MK, uh, in the MK movie's novelization. I mean, there are so. It, it is a, a funny idea. And Sonya only fights Kano in the movie, so it would have been nice to give her a second tournament fight. It would be. But at the same time, I'm like, yeah, I can see why that was cut. It's a scene that doesn't particularly add anything. Yeah, not really. I don't it's just, think that there's... It's just kind of a funny gag, and also, like, people who actually like Jade would probably be pissed off. Although... Maybe that would be more dignified than what our uh, Annihilation did with Jade. <laughs> I suppose that now is the time to briefly mention uh, both of Sonya's movie performances. Right. So, we, we've already talked about the first film a bit here and there. Because it is so um, important to Sonya. It has... It's pretty much what's defined her personality as a character. Right. And it created the connection to Johnny Cage. Um, so really that just leaves Annihilation, which Sonya is in quite a bit, but does it matter? <laughs> <laughs> like, she's really just kind of a vehicle to get Jax into the movie, 
because somebody was really, really, really looking forward to writing Jack's dialogue. <laughs> he's he's pretty much. I can't say the high point of the film. He's like the only point of the film, and she's just there to allow him to happen. <laughs> I don't mind Sandra Hess as Sonia. Now she was all right in the role. Like, performance is, is it's it's pretty good. So here's like she doesn't have Bridget's bitch face, but she's obviously more athletic. Like mm -hmm. she can do fight scenes. Um, I wouldn't say that as an actress her performance was greater than or less than. It was a recasting which didn't really hurt or help the film one way or another. Yeah, it's it's sort of the least offensive of the recasts. She has more acting chops than Talisa Soto. I'm sorry, I like Riz Katana, but <laughs> Talisa Soto is not the film's best cast. No, anyway. no, Talisa Soto is just a model. Yeah, She does not particularly excel at delivering lines. She tries. I mean, she's, her face defines Katana for me, but I'm not going to defend her her acting. No. <laughs> um, although the dialogue she was given to work with wasn't great either. Katana uh, in those movies life? is really just another Raiden, like a second person to deliver exposition. Cryptic exposition. Mm. So I guess that's Sony and all the forms of media we'd care to cover, unless you have anything to say about Legacy, because I don't. Well, I mean, okay, so not Legacy, though, but, like, uh, Annihilation D did give us that weird attempt at realismifying the kiss of death. Which... I actually do appreciate about it. And let's say I mean, earlier, I, I, I think appreciate that, they... that it tried. It's just that the effect looked so goddamn bad. <laughs> That's a fault of the CG of the time. It Like it's be it really was fair fire. Though. It was fire until it touched Cyrax's body, and then it was just him turning red. <laughs> because video game accuracy? And he doesn't even explode, he just falls down. He's he's lightly crisped. But I, yeah. I think I get what they're going for there. And I'm going to be really fair about this. Reptile in the first MK movie now objectively looks like shit. Well, Reptile looked like shit in 95. Yes, he did. I'm just saying. <laughs> Annihilation, that CG was never good. <laughs> Annihilation's weaknesses aren't exclusive to Annihilation. That's all I'm saying. It's I, fair. I give Annihilation a lot of they tried points, and I think a lot of Ascension just, fans tend to do that. I feel like fire you can do practical. I don't know why they needed to CGI that. <laughs> they might have not wanted to burn the outfit because they blew their budget on hookers and blow, and might have had to reshoot scenes. It might have been out of concern. Well, they clearly had a charred version of Cyrax because he's lying on the ground with like holes in him. I don't know. I like I like how his self destruct device is in his shoulder, and that they were so lucky to have put a hole in his shoulder so they could see the self destruct device. One day we're gonna do an episode about all the stupid shit that doesn't fit anywhere else in the lore, that is not directly <laughs> pertinent to the characters, and like. Topic number 17 is going to be the self-destruct tattoos in Annihilation, because what the hell? Oh, man. So, Sonya Blade. I guess now is the time where we talk about um, her various looks over the ages. Yeah. Uh, so, aerobics, though, right? <laughs> I was able to buy it in MK1. It, it was the 90s. That was standard yes. athletic wear for a female character. MP3 and, like, we, we talked like, about this a little bit before. Did. About how, like, I can buy, like, look. She's been kidnapped and forced into a sporting event. She's gonna 
take off her fatigues and whatever she's got on underneath. That's what she's going to fight in because it's comfortable. But then in MK3, it's like, let's double down on the aerobics gear. <laughs> there is no way anyone fights in what she's wearing unless she would just happen to be out jogging at the time the invasion took place and had literally no time to wear anything else. That's the only way what she's wearing there makes sense. I mean, in MK3, it's not just... It's not just that she's dressed to jazzercise. It, <laughs> white high-top sneakers. It's the headband. Like, it's all blatantly gym wear. Yes. No other way around it. And I'm just like, you couldn't have, like, put a logo on her shirt or something? And it's not just gym wear. It's gaudy gym wear, too. Because like, Tobias... Tobias drew a logo on her shirt in the MK1 uh, comic book. Trying to, like, say that, no, this is, like, the Special Forces uniform. It's like, they're G.I. Joe. They wear these superhero-y costumes. As opposed to, like, real army fatigues. But... <sighs> the 1 and 3 is just too stripey. And it's just like, look, just put a logo, please. Just something. Like, a utility belt instead of that jewelry belt. Like, that dangly metal circles belt. I'm still not sure what the fuck that thing's supposed to be. It's... I've seen hippies wear those. Have you? I yeah, it's, 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 vaguely, it's, it's vaguely Native American look, jewelry looking. Although hers is just plain silver discs. Like, it doesn't have all the just, fringy that, parts. It. it doesn't look like anything. No, it just... It just pure decoration <laughs> like pockets come on <laughs> think the, about it for one second the color scheme is just so terrible too the I don't, I don't mind the, the color scheme black. like it's it's the same color scheme she always has it's green, green white needs and black. to be toned down a little bit it was it was a bit darker in mk1 that's true it was more it was more olive yeah, in mk1 yeah. It's the the shape of the stripes. It's it looks like gym wear. That's yeah. And this is a trend which kind of dies off now. Yeah, that is that is the last of that. Like when we get to MK4, she's still wearing skin tight clothing, but it looks more professional because she's got like she's got a cap on. And there is a logo on her shirt, yeah. and she's got, like, a proper utility belt, and there's, like, a belt around her thigh full of shotgun shells, and she's got, like, combat boots. A couple of pouches on that belt. Yeah. And she's got the cap. Yeah. This is the first like, time in, in games where she's had the cap, and I rather like the cap on her. Yeah, she wears the cap in the movie, that's probably why they started yeah. putting her in the cap. It does look good. Like, I like her MK4 outfit a lot. It's so moving into Deadly Alliance. So, Deadly Alliance would actually be one of my favorite Sonya costumes if... I mean, she's got this weird mom hair, for one thing. <laughs> and here we're saying that they don't age her hair enough. <laughs> I actually rather like the mom hair. It's good. It's all right. Um, what what hurts this outfit is the graphics of Deadly Alliance. Really, her anatomy is just all over the place. <laughs> but like, as a as a the clothing is actually perfectly fine. Like, I really like the jacket. The jacket's good. We've got the continued theme of a bear midriff. Nothing new there. Although, this is this is. It the, has to be said, the, the first the game thong. where she starts wearing her thong like the pro wrestler Lita. <laughs> and it's Just fucking terrible. Hike that thing up above the pants line as high as it'll go. Like, this doesn't even... this In this game, it doesn't actually look like a thong. It looks like she's got some kind of weird straps attached to her belt that go up <laughs> instead of hanging down. It's like suspenders somehow. It's just... just... 
it's stupid and it's a combat hazard. Why wouldn't someone grab that during a fight? Just, ugh. Well, you can't because it's obviously painted onto her skin. <laughs> well, yes, there is that. I think I can detect some blood flow being lost there. Honestly, I look at the render. It's like it, it looks like it's incredibly tight and painful. And how do the physics like even this is work? this is the highest a thong has ever been hiked up in the history of underwear. <laughs> it's almost parallel to her belly button. It's it's practically touching her shirt, and her shirt <laughs> is cut off at the midriff. <laughs> That's not how thongs work. What is this it really, thing? It really does look like some kind of weird stomach suspenders. It's not underwear. This is not a thong. <laughs> uh, doesn't get damseled, but Jesus, this terrible choice. Whatever but, this uh, is. I, I like the jacket, though. <laughs> Jacket's nice. Uh, I dig the straight black leather pants. Yeah, the pants are fine. They're a little plain, but they're perfectly fine. She got herself a collar here, too. Uh, so I, what I really like is her alternate, because it looks like, first of all, it is the first and maybe only time in MK that they have actually put a green beret on a green beret. <laughs> like, Jax wears a red beret! Like, I don't know if, I don't know if people are aware of this, but the U.S. Army Special Forces have the nickname the Green Berets because they wear green berets. <laughs> Let's see. The Red Beret is a military beret worn by many military police, paramilitary, commando, and police forces. This appears to be mainly a European thing. Yeah, yeah, I don't I don't think red berets are all that common in America in the army. Boy Scouts of America. Native American <laughs> organizations. American warrior societies. Okay. And we are I not... don't think they thought about it very much. No, but... this is not a thing that American military men wear. This is European. No, like, but yes, yeah, Sonia, Sonia in her alternate costume is clearly dressed for like a, a formal, like an award ceremony or a like she's, a 21 gun salute funeral. She's got parade boots. Like, I like it. It's good. It's absolutely unfeasible to fight in because of the fucking heels. No, but, but that aside, but I was it, it, I still am very happy way, about it. It works the way Johnny in a tuxedo works. This is something that the character would actually be wearing. Yeah. And she's still wearing the same gloves she had on. The gloves kind of conflict with it a little bit, but... <laughs> it's true. The the it's, motorcycle gloves. <laughs> it's forgivable. I like it on the whole. I'm alright with it. It remained my favorite costume of hers for quite some time. I mean, she wears the same stuff in the entire 3D era because she wasn't in Deception. Yeah. So that, that brings us to Shaolin Monks. Which... Is basically, uh, it's fairly inspired by her Deadly Alliance primary. Like, she has a jacket. It's not as cool of a jacket. Like, it's just a plain brown leather jacket. Whereas the one in Deadly Alliance is covered in, like, army patches and an American flag and all kinds of, like... Like, that's that's an army jacket, and this is just... She visited looks a like... shop. Yeah. I like the camo but... pants, though. Yeah, what I really like is the camo pants. Because, no, like, before. I could see that being how you remake her MK1 outfit, is just change the green spandex pants into camo pants. It's a good redesign. They knew they couldn't uh, leave everyone the way they were, and she was the most glaringly obvious example. Hers was a remake out of necessity, and it's... Yeah. Like, if I, if I had any the most part all right. at all, like, instead of a black shirt, I'd have put... P probably put her in an olive green tank top. Right. And I would have put gauntlets on her because of the, you know, the laser rings. That's it. Other the than that, it is, looks real good. The thong is still there, though. I mean, the, the thong, thong is... looks like a thong now, though, so at least there's that. 
And this render, it's parallel to her belly button. It's yep. still bothering me. Her belly button is lower on her body than in Deadly Alliance, though, because they have a better understanding of anatomy in this render. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Also, she has a pierced belly button, if you zoom in on it. <laughs> Ah, whatever. I don't know about that choice. Sometimes she drinks from under the table, and sometimes she drinks from under the table and makes a bad life choice, and oh well, I have this now. At, at least, yeah, at least it's not a tramp stamp. There you go. <laughs> See, I don't I don't mind the, the thong slightly showing on principle, because I do have this... My, my thoughts on Sonya as a person is that I think she tries to retain a little of her feminine side despite being such an aggressive um, and, <clears throat> you know, a military character. You know, she wants to be taken seriously, but I think she does also want people to think she's attractive, at least a little bit. Somewhat. So I don't, I don't mind the thong. Like, I never really have. There are there are people who hate it and don't think it should be in any costume. It's I don't it's, I don't care about it that deeply. I think it's fine. It's just not something that I envision any member of the military working while they're all, sporting. Well, no, I wouldn't. You know, it's, it's obviously silly. when she's in uniform, I wouldn't. But like if it's just if it just happens to be peeking out while she's wearing what she wears at the tournament, I don't care. <laughs> We're moving into also territory where it looks like she's wearing military outfits and yeah. pants. And th this actually, this does bring us to MKDC. Because here, she's got these pants. These are plainly military getups. She's got boots with four buckles each on them. She's got gauntlets. She's got that green beret. Yeah, but she's wearing absolutely nothing but this tidy whitey uh, overshirt thing, which just covers her boobs and her shoulders and nothing else. And there's a thong imprint. Yeah, there's a there's a tan line, which is... now that no, I could see Sonia as the kind this. of person who goes to the beach as a tan line, as like. A reference to sometimes she wears thongs, but she's not hiking it above her pants right now. See, this is I the feel thing like that's that... a compromise that is fair and barely noticeable. I don't know. See, this this to me kind of indicates that what they're suggesting is that she wears this thing outside all the time, which is one of the reasons I'm just not cool with it. it it's silly. There's no practical reason for it. It's Look, here's... not military dress. It... No, see, my, it's a, my it's whole a bit argument... over the top. My argument would be that nobody except farmers, like people who work outside in the heat a lot, are the only people who get tans who didn't do it on purpose. Especially on your stomach. Like, the only way for those tan lines to exist is if she went to the beach and tanned. It's a justification for it that I can't quite buy. I just, it's, I feel it's like a very, this It's is... a very convenient tan line to have. Well, I'm let not me ask go you this. I'm out of my way to justify it. Let me ask you this. Shoot. Is the tan lines more believable, or is the thong itself more believable? Like, if it, if she had the thong on his costume, or... I shouldn't have to choose. <laughs> and but... I wouldn't, and I don't want either one of them. Fair enough, it's, but if you did have to choose, to would you... Her up and she doesn't need it. Would you take... I... If she had, if she if... had the thong tan line in, in perpetuity... Okay, well, then... what if she was wearing a better top, and the tan lines were the only part of the outfit that sexed her up? I don't think I would have minded it that much. Okay. That's fair. Because really, my argument is just, like, Sonya should be dressed like a normal person 99% of the way, and then 1% is her trying to look hot. It's a gratuitous 1%, and we've already got her midriff showing as a constant, constant element. That's always kind of well, let's, put the goods on so, display a little bit. 
so there's there's a couple other elements here that are recurring. Um, the entire 3D era and her DC versus DCU costume, she's wearing a choker. Yes. Which is um, probably not standard military issue. <laughs> I am wondering about that a little bit. It's hard to actually see what the choker constitutes in it's the... It's literally uh... just a belt attached to a gold ring. No, no, I'm talking about, like, the the Deadly Alliance version. Oh, it's I'm pretty sure... what's going on there. It's... I'm pretty sure it's a belt with a little gold buckle on it. I don't hate it, but I do think she looks better without it. Like, for all my problems with MK9's outfit, and we'll get to that momentarily... Yeah, she like, looks way I better with dog it. tags. Well, here's the thing. On her versus DCU outfit, they put the dog tags uh, on her waist, like dangling from her actual belt. It's a nice detail, but it's really understated, and not enough, enough attention is drawn to it. It's a good character detail to have. Like, Colonel Gal shouldn't be the only one that's got dog tags on him. You know? Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, so f with her versus DC outfit, her belt is the most visually interesting part of her, because she's got this fancy OIA logo belt buckle... And the dog tags are right next to it. And then she has like a a tiny strap dangling from her belt to nowhere. Like I don't know if that's supposed to attach to a gun holster and it's just not holstering a gun right now, but... Here's my question. What are those shoulder straps for? Uh, also a gun holster with no gun, I guess. <laughs> I need to actually look at the sprite from the bat, because those don't look like they serve any kind of purpose. No, I think they're just there to put something on her upper body, because they went, <laughs> well, all she's wearing this is this plain white tank top, and it's like, it's like threadbare, like you can see her nipples through it. God, it's really fucking terrible. You can totally see her nipples in MK vs. DC. Yes, you can. <laughs> There are many reasons why I hate this outfit. And yes, it's... I'm not making this up. You can no. look this up yourselves. I am staring the... at this right now. It's a tit nipply out of the Special Forces base. <laughs> you can tell. No, I think I think that's like a gun holster without the holster. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, Jax wears one of those in Shaolin Monks. Except I think he actually has a gun in Shaolin Monks. <laughs> And there's also there's also several outfits in the 3D era where um, Sonya has just two belts around her thigh for no reason, just squall Lee and heartening it. She's always had um, uh, the odd strap around like her shoulder or her bicep or her thigh. Well, like it's, it's a running at least, theme with her. I in MK4 at least there were shotgun shells on that thing. Yeah, <laughs> like. Ever since, it's just, well, we always put two belts there, so let's put two belts there. <laughs> Which I get. Like, if I was designing a ca the character, I would try to keep some things from game to game to game, so it always looks like that character's habits. But just put something on the belts, maybe. That's all I'm saying. Like, have them there for a reason. You don't have to get rid of them, just have them for a reason. <laughs> Speaking of putting Maybe something Maybe a knife, on, a combat knife. You know, she doesn't have to use it in the fight, just put it there. I actually kind of figured that that's what that was for. In terms of MK9. Like, there should be some sort of yeah, knife that, sitting there. That, yeah, that brings us to MK9, where she has the two belts on her thigh, but they actually attach to a pocket, and it's probably for, like, a combat knife or something. If years of collecting G.I. Joe's has taught me anything, that's what that leg strap is for. Her pants and belts are definitely the most acceptable thing about her MK9 outfit. <laughs> right. Because what she had in MKDC is what she's missing in MK9. Yes. And what she has outfit... in MK9 is what she was missing in MKDC. A top. If you just, yes, if you just like combine the two, like put that undershirt on under this vest. You would have Perfectly a full fine. costume, yes. Why? But, 
Okay, th this vest doesn't even- this vest looks like a, it's made of a material that would chafe the shit out of your bare nipples. It does not Like, look this does not look comfortable at all. <laughs> and apparently, like, there's no- there's no zipper on this vest, and there's no buttons on this vest. There's- Because- There's a strap her, at the bottom. cannot contain her- and she has to, like, have these little buckles added at the bottom to hold it together. <laughs> It's such a fucking weird design. The thong's gone, though. The thong's gone, That's true. but... Well, it, instead of the thong, they've put two dangling suspender straps that hang upside down from the vest. So, so she still has that shape on her midriff. It's just upside down. <laughs> and her belt does not actually appear to be attached to her pants. No, her belt's just kind of dangling on her hip. I have so many levels of what the fuckness. I mean, these pants are so tight they don't need a belt, so whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christ. No, this is... So... Th the, the pants are fine, and everything above that's just a clusterfuck of catastrophes. Except for she is... except for the dog tags. Well, yeah, she is actually wearing her dog tags around her neck, which is nice. The gloves are fine. Um, I like that she has a badge now. Like, it's in the place where that logo was on her MK1 outfit in the comic book. It's a good touch. I think, actually, I think this badge is a reused asset because this same badge is on her hat in Versus DC. Exactly the same. Let's say that. I it's exactly the same, the same if yeah, you zoom in. It is. So it is. I'm pretty sure um, some people have been able to zoom in enough to read her dog tags. And uh, what's interesting is. Please tell me it says I'm Charlie. I'm pretty Nash. sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can read her date of birth and that it does line up with what her age so like in the MK1 comics she's 26 years old so this date of birth is basically accurate if she was 26 in the year 1992 which I mean when MK9 came out was probably weird because people probably thought it would be set in the present day as a reboot. But now that we're um, 25 years in the future, I think MKX is the present day and MK9 is indeed set in the early 90s. Most probably. For a while I was on the opinion that it was a sliding timeline just because of the tech and it was advanced, but I guess you have to yeah. squint your eyes and just suspend disbelief there a little bit. Yeah, but I mean, like, if you think about it, the advanced tech is the same advanced tech that existed in the games when just they were made. Developed on a little bit. It's just it's just radios and cyber ninjas. Like nobody nobody pulls out a smartphone in MK9. True. I mean, she did have an alternate in nine. It was it was literally just um, mirror shades to make her look like Sarah Connor. The white tank top comes back, and she's wearing booty shorts. I don't hate it. It's fine for an alternate. Yeah, it's... It's, it's just it's, very it's kind plain of, is the problem. Kind of halfway Lara Croft, halfway Sarah Connor. It's... Yeah. Generic action starlet. I guess the bullet belt's a nice touch. I just I just feel like a little more... A few more belts and whistles would help. Before we jump to X, there is one more thing I want to say about her 9 primary. Shoot. The green is so dark and desaturated... That a lot of fan art and cosplayers think she's wearing black clothes. That bugs the shit out of me. It's there in the same way it's there on her MKDC pants. It's just... <sighs> Sonya's color is green. That's her thing. It's a case of they've... They've bounced back and forth with it. It's... It was too light in MK3. MK1 set the standard, and here it's too dark. It just it just really bothers me. Like, that's such an easy fix. They kind of, like, transmitted it entirely to her pants. Mm. It's much more visible on her pants than it is in, uh, on her vest in that render. Yeah. Which brings us to 10. Yeah. They all kind of blend together for me a little bit. Yeah, well, but... here's, so, 
Let's start with the primary, because the alternates are a bit different. I mean, they're the same as each other, but they're different from the primary, so... Yes. The primary's the go-to for me. Right. So, I mean, first of all, it's all blue. She looks like, um... She looks like modern Jill Valentine. Okay, not unfair. Which is... Like, I don't dislike this outfit. I'm not complaining. I just wish it were green is all. Like, <laughs> that's oh, it. <laughs> that's, that's valid. I mean, I said for many, many years that I was tired of the thong and I wanted her to actually dress like a military officer or someone who was working with, in Black Ops or Special Forces. And I got what I wanted. It seems bland. I think that's due more in part to the fact that we've had these conversations before about how MKX's color palette doesn't really do a lot of people a lot of favors. Yeah. If she was wearing this in nine, it's, I think it's a little be, dark and gray. People yeah. Would be drooling over it. I actually really I think, like a lot of it. It is like it's a perfectly good design. I mean, there's some interesting choices here. Like, she's got this rope around one shoulder, like it's a dress uniform, but the rest of the outfit is clearly a field outfit. It's a good visual highlight to make sure everything's not all desaturated and bland and gross and she's, boring. The hat is back, but there's, like, a logo on it. Yep. There's this interesting thing where she's got, like, these thigh highs over top of her pants. <laughs> and I think it actually does bear uh, mentioning... This is the first time, I think, where, like, she doesn't have biker gloves or jazzercise gloves. The gauntlets yeah. actually appear to be things that can now channel energy. Yes, they, they, they actually... They look high-tech. Like, they put, like a, like, a barrel on the gauntlets to shoot the rings. Which I can only say about fucking time. Yeah, yeah, I like it. I'm also like, kind of, like, the popped collar, too. yeah. I mean, her collar is kind of popped in 9, too, but it was more of a... I don't know if that collar could fold down. It was thicker. But, like... But, yeah, for the most part, this is just, like, a really gray-blue with a tiny bit of yellow. It could have been helped by making parts of it a bit greener. Yeah. But I'm not offended by it. It's fine. So what's, what's weird to me is that... So she has two alternates. Yeah. Well, not counting fucking Red Sun Superman and the MK1 Retro. I'll be fair to the MK1 Retro. They did a good job. Yeah, it's... It's convincing. It's one of, some of the MK1 Retros are not accurate at all, like Kano's. Looking at you, Kano. But this one looks good. Like, they even changed her hair for it, which I appreciate. But but her tournament outfit and her... I forget what the other one is called. Yeah, it's not important. Up. The point is, no, no, so, so her, main, her main alternate outfit is the one she wears in the Johnny Cage chapter. And it is the plainest shirt, pants, and vest combo... I've ever goddamn seen. Like, yeah, it's green, so it's got that, but... Like, you couldn't... There's no... There's only one... Like, there's no extra belts. There's nothing dangling from the vest. There's, like, no badges or logos. It's literally just a person in a shirt and pants wearing a vest. And what's weird about it is that her tournament outfit is the same design, but with all the bells and whistles. Like, and and what I love, I actually really, really like this outfit, because this is obviously a remake of the MK9 costume. But it's properly done. Yeah, like, they listened to all the things people said they wanted that outfit to have, like an undershirt. There's like, and the undershirt isn't just plain white, it's black and white striped, so it kind of references MK3 a little bit. Yep. And, and her pants are camo. camo pants. They're not just 
plain it's green. A, it's a great costume. I really like this outfit, yeah. And I just, I wish this is the one she had in 9. Uh, but I just, I, I just, my question is, like, why would you even make the other one when you already have this one? You mean the default, the main? Yeah, why, why is the default shirt, pants, and vest in the game? Why couldn't she just be wearing this in, in chapter <laughs> 1? Well, there, there was a noticeable um, theme with a lot of MK9's costumes, and that was you had a tournament outfit, and then you had an MK9 outfit. Like, Katana's got one of these two, I think. And so does Melina, well, I'm pretty sure. Katana, Katana has... So Katana's primary is supposed to be... It's a non-canon outfit, and it's like them trying to fool us into thinking that she came back from the dead. And then she has the tournament outfit, which is a remake of her MK9 primary. Yeah. So it's just... They're making distinctions between specific MK9-esque costumes. Like, Scorpion has his MK9 costume as a skin. Like, that's how he starts out. Yeah, but he wears that in story mode. He does. Like, like I just, I just want the, the Sonya's point I'm is just outfit that... to be. I just want it to be what she wore in story mode instead of having two outfits that are shirt, pants, vest, and one being infinitely more boring than the other. They wanted to have something that shows where she is now as opposed to where she was then. That's all that this yeah, really but... is. Doing. Yeah, but I it, don't. It's a down. I, it's. I don't disagree. Like I would so, be here's the like, cap on the if you follow, if you follow, if you like, pay attention across MKX. So in MK9, she's lieutenant, and so that's where she's wearing the tournament outfit. MKX, she starts as I believe a colonel, and she's wearing a much plainer outfit. And then in the present day parts of X, she's a general. And that's where she's wearing the primary. The one with uh, just the vest and no hat is called the Major Blade outfit. Major. Oh, she's a colonel in the comic book. So she goes Lieutenant, Major, Colonel, General. Which is something we mentioned about the old timeline that they never promoted her. So I'm actually really happy they did that in the new timeline. It's just like, why is the Major outfit less cool looking than l the lieutenant outfit <laughs> if i had to pick a preferred one out of all these it probably would be the uh the mk9 version the corrected one it's just a lot of crazy d detail about it and yeah you're right it's it's the culmination of a lot of fans like myself going stop fucking up <laughs> the major one is just a tad bland even the belt buckle's a little bit dingy it's not a good look. Meh. Not a good look, fam. <laughs> but yeah. The tournament and the main, they're fine by me. They're good. I mean, do we care about Red Sun Superman? <laughs> uh... What did they call it? Cold War with a K, that's... For the motherland. Ah, oh, fuck me. Why? Why is this a thing? <laughs> if we talk about this... Like, it doesn't look bad, I just don't understand the purpose. <laughs> if we talk about this, we're contractually obligated to talk about all of the silly, sticky costumes. And we already did not give Johnny Cage's Brazil outfit the benefit of discussion. <laughs> That's so fair. So I move that we just skip that entirely. Alright, we're moving things. on. So, um, yeah. let's talk about her uh, MKX ending before we move on to something else. Because a, that should probably probably bring us to the end. There's a there's something about this one where it's just like the MK9 one, where it's like, hey, let's let's reference something that might be interesting, but we'll never actually use in a story ever. Bless them. So her MKX ending is that she takes a nap and has like a prophetic dream. Of And in, the content of the dream is that it's a nightmare where Kano is making her choose, I'm going to shoot either Cassie or Jax, which one? And she 
in the dream picks Cassie to live, and then when she wakes up, she finds out that Aaron Black has killed Jax, which happens in Jax's ending. Because this is one of those games where some of the endings are connected. Right. So it's like, hey, maybe Sonya has psychic powers? No, we'll never see that again. That's not going to be a thing in MK11. <laughs> maybe it's... Some people just see things that happen in their dreams, or they think that they do, or they have premonitions, or when they're like, hey, maybe I dreamt this. Maybe it's psychic powers, maybe it's just... Maybe it's I just feel this like dream just... realm the mystery woman's supposed to be part of. Freddy maybe, Peter. but... I, I just, I don't know, this feels like they ran out of ideas. For a couple of games now, it's I feel like they've been giving us arcade endings out of courtesy and tradition. With very little <sighs> forethought and planning behind them. Like, sometimes there's an we, obvious... Sometimes we there's get the nice still nods, an but... obvious place. There's an obvious place for endings, and it's that story mode epilogues would be satisfying. I don't know why they don't do it either. No, I don't. I'm yeah, why do they still keep giving us this goofy what if bullshit? I mean, we have a history of what if bullshit, but character endings in arcade used to actually mean a little bit. We more. we had a history of what if bullshit. The but what if bullshit. It is wasn't the standard. It was at a super it, it minimum in the would... 3D era. Like in Deadly Alliance and Deception, the only time we get what if bullshit is when a character is like going to die in that game, so their ending is impossible anyway. And there was a certain tendency towards it with a lot of characters who were plainly never, ever be the ones to defeat Shao Kahn in the original trilogy of games, so going up to trilogy, where you had things like Melina and Baraka, who would rule as king and queen after beating Shao Kahn. Yeah, but like... Smoke, I mean, even... Smoke and Ultimate having... Oh, you know, this is... This is just the way I'll never be ever again, and... Things that even... don't actually matter. Even in um even in the original arcade games, the goofy what if endings were still like halfway informative because they'd give you a bit of backstory that was canon that was like secret and being revealed in the ending, and then they'd tell you what if he beat Shao Kahn. But in nine and X, they're just like, what? <laughs> For the most part. Like, you still get the reveal sometimes, like, Smoke's ending is how we know he's in an Enra. But, for the most part, they're just filler now. And it's depressing. <sighs> I do want it to mean something else again. It would be nice. But, right. um, I guess that's really it for Sonya. And, uh, alright, I guess a couple of last, qu a few, uh, choices. Favorite Fatality? Uh, my favorite Sonya fatality is... <sighs> Gotta be the classic Kiss of Death. The MK1 variation? Yeah. Nice. I mean, if we're going for the best graphics version of it, it's in MKX as a retro finisher. It's nice. But I've always actually had a weak spot for that, uh, implodey version of MK3s. That's... The the it's weird, more the it's more like cage. they're being like crushed by an energy cage yeah. and that's weird to me cuz like okay so there's maybe something going on there because in MK9 if you remember there's that scene where she breaks Jax out of the bars where like she uses her rings but they snake around the bars in this really weird way and I've always been like, what the fuck is happening right then? What is that scene? What is this tech? Laser beams don't work that way. What is it doing? And how is it doing it? <laughs> Special Forces tech. Nanomachine, son. Who fucking knows? <sighs> So, I do like I do like when she uses the rings to catarize Jax's arm wounds. <laughs> well, that tells us a little bit about their properties, doesn't it? Yeah. Shit burns. Shit burns and is... crushes steel? <laughs> Special forces techs, interesting. Maybe those gauntlets Maybe... have multiple settings. Yeah, there must there has to be multiple settings. This does not make sense Stun, any other way. Kill, crush, destroy. 
Fucking who knows. So I guess I guess she's doing her MK3 finisher on the bars. <laughs> okay. Smile and nod. Don't know why she wouldn't do the MK4 variation, which just chops shit up, but anyway. Yeah, right. Like, it, it goes shriek like it makes a cutting sound. <laughs> I've liked that one visually, but it's just, it's a little bit kooky for me. It's this well, glowing sphere that somehow has the properties of a razor blade. What I like about it is the camera cuts. Like, it shows the slice three times. <laughs> oh, it's definitely dramatic. It's just awkward. It's super awkward. So yeah, my uh, my favorite's the uh, MK3 crushing sphere. And Fair enough. I just want to bring up a little bit of trivia here. Well, I also like... I also like, um, she has it in a couple of games. I think MK4 and MK9. The leg grab where the, she then splits them in half. The physics of it bother me because... Like, it I doesn't make any sense, that's no. true. It's like, it's like the torso is becoming glued to one leg, it's and the rest is becoming glued to the other leg. It's visually appealing, <laughs> like but if it's she... also very fucking stupid. If she squeezed first to, like cut them in half, and then kicked so the two parts went in opposite directions. It would make more sense. What I would probably do is I'd have her, I don't know, roll forward, kick them upwards, do a handstand, plunge both feet into the abdomen, and then tear in opposite directions. <laughs> a little bit more involved, but the effect it's is basically the It's basically lose MKX uh, fatality, but upside down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They fucked up. So, a little bit of trivia involving Sonya's finishers, or one of them, one finisher. Do you remember her MK3 friendship? Where she just swung her arms back and forth? Yes. You I know why she was doing that, what? right? Because uh, bouncy, bouncy. No. Now, I forget which home version of it was. Maybe all of them, I forget. Her friendship was altered at some points so that she. I do saluted. remember it's different in trilogy. That that's probably it. That that's probably what I'm remembering because she salutes and a bunch of flowers come up out of the ground. Yeah. So that was this little weird bit of trivia that I figured I'd mention before it gets lost to the mists of time. She had an MK3 friendship, which was just designed to j to jiggle her tits, and then it was <laughs> smartly annihilated. Have some pretty flowers. Moving on. <laughs> I never, I, as a kid, I didn't notice the tit jiggle because the sprite was, and she's blocking it with her arms as she swings them, so you can't it's really. It's not good at what it's trying to do. No. What it's trying to do is pretty obvious. Like, if they had just had her, like, jump on a trampoline, that would be. <laughs> I guess they had their limits. They could have given her the jump rope instead of Jack's. <laughs> Maybe that was the plan. Anyway, um, there is one more thing about finishers I want to mention with Sonya. Because it's a, it's a characterization point. So, we've talked a lot about how Sonya is kind of boring and never really grows as a character. Yep. So she has this one fatality in X, where as she unleashes her, her army drone to, um blast all the skin off your face with a machine gun and then explode it into the air with a rocket launcher. She then, like, uses her garret wire to catch the head and attach it to her belt and keep it as a trophy. Every single time I see that fatality, I get Front 242's headhunter stuck in my head. Yeah, see, it reminds me of the fucking Predator. Like, what the fuck is she doing? This is insane. <laughs> it's one and of those the only moments thing... where I'm like, I'm categorizing that with Kung Lao forcing your face down onto a buzzsaw. Right, right. As, as the game presents it, it's the same thing as Kung Lao fucking cutting you into the shape of a flower. <laughs> it is out of character sadism. I think but, we have a nice long talk about all of Kung Lao's fatalities because holy <laughs> Jesus Christ. Right. Like, in-game pacifist. 
once somebody says finish him, the different character. <laughs> the creative psycho comes out. He becomes Cletus Cassidy. <laughs> Basically. But no, like, so, so yeah, it's just, it's just typical out of character sadism in a finishing move as the game presents it. My argument is this fatality is what her character maybe should be. Like, it would make more sense to me if Sonya, after 25 years of fighting Outworlders, is as messed up as a Vietnam veteran. I would be okay with this if that ending where she rides off with a motorcycle to hunt people down were actually a thing. Like, as this, it is I'm now, just... obviously no. Like, I like that she got with Johnny, and I like that Cassie exists. I just want a Sonya who is fucking, like, Baraka's in the trees, man. <laughs> I want, when she wears that fucking camo face paint in her one variation, and she fucking collects the heads of her victims, I want that to be canon. <laughs> I think that I will save that story that's a much for more, more... That is a more interesting Sonya to me. <laughs> I don't think interesting has to equivalent to broken, but I see where you're coming from. I think, I'm not saying it has to, I'm saying for Sonya, maybe it should. I'll give that one to Earth 3, Sonya. <laughs> it's, I would not mind having that MK game where a lot of, where I'm we just, get that crisis on infinite combat and shit happens to horrible people in every reality and we see messed up versions of them. I'm okay with this. I wouldn't, I, I don't know. Like, I think it's I think it's more interesting in a universe where it's not the norm. Like, I just want one person to to show the effect of fighting war with supernatural monsters for twenty five years. I don't want them all to show it because then it becomes a grim dark universe that I don't want to be in. Like, injustice is. That's the thing. We've already got like the twisted turned characters in terms of revenants. I know how you feel about those. But yeah, that's... but. That's why we're not going to get Sony going down this path. It's artificial is the thing. Like, I, I just know. want somebody who... I just want something different from Sonya. And I don't want it to be something different that's, like, subtle. Like, she's a mom now. That's not different enough. I just want... I feel like of all the characters in the franchise, if I was going to pick someone to have PTSD, Sonya makes the most sense. Like, her or Stryker, one of the normies. And Stryker is a revenant, so you can't do it with him. The thing I really want from Sony is a personal reason to be there. That doesn't involve Jason Kano. I want her to feel like more of a member of Raiden's Chosen Ones. More of a member of the family, so to speak. And less of a person who is there because... A, it's her duty, and B, yes, sure, I'll help save the world. That's that's a good point. Like I that's... I do really like that she goes to the Lin Kuei Temple in Deadly Alliance. Yes. Because it's like I never would have thought that her and Sub Zero have ever given each other the time of day before. And I would like a little bit but, more of that. But yeah, like if Raiden's chosen are actually like more than something more than getting together every couple of years to fight a war and then going their separate ways. Like if they actually kept in contact. That would be something, you know? Like, I just... I want Sonya to, like, have some kind of relationship with other characters. I, I think that she'd be really well served by doing this. These moments that I'm mentioning, like, her offering Johnny her hand, or her going to see, like, Sub-Zero at the temple. The MKX, uh... comics elaborations on their relationship. Every time this happens, you know, you love her a little bit more. And you've got to put the extra effort in when your character is resting bitch face the character. <laughs> so I guess that, uh, that about wraps things up for our Sonya retrospective. Yeah, I mean, I guess we could talk a little bit about where we think, like, do you think she'll be on the roster in 11? Do you think uh, she'll just be, like, a desk job NPC type of thing? Because that's I, kind of what I would prefer at this point. I think it could honestly go either way. And I'm not sure, but I I would prefer that she took a breather along with Kano and probably Jax too. Like, I, my argument is always that you need Jax because he's the only guy that does the pro wrestling moves. But... Uh, 
people were complaining that, I don't know, Jackie was too similar to him or not similar. But Jackie, it, 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 Jackie it only does boring. his punchy stuff. She does the most boring parts of Jax. That's the problem. Yeah. Like, if she was the pile drivers and suplexes character instead of the boxing character, then I would be okay with her instead of Jax. But yeah. she's not, so I want Jax instead of her. Make a new grappler. It's a discussion for the Jax retrospective, oh. but... There are characters who just coast on legacy status or developer preference, and Jax pretty much tops up that list for me. Yeah, but, I mean, I don't trust them to make a new grappler because most fighting game designers in the current era, when they make grapplers, they make them big Tor-sized guys, and I don't like that archetype. I don't know. MKX proved to me that they've got a lot of leeway and talent as far as designing new people goes. I'd give them a shot. Eh, I mean, if they design a new pro wrestling moves guy, and I like him, then sure, Jax can sit out, but... A surprising amount of people in MKX have command grabs that don't actually really even need them. Yeah, but I want the command grab to specifically be a fucking power bomb. I don't care if you're just throwing a guy. Do it the way a wrestler would do it. That's the thing. I want a WWE character, not a grappler, a WWE character. Hager for 11. <laughs> Gotta put him in something. Yeah? You know what? Get um Max Thunder from Streets of Rage. <laughs> that should be the guest character. He's not a grappler per se, but uh, Kotal Khan's kind of brushing on that archetype just a little bit. Yeah. I mean, Kotal could do more. So it would be better than throwing a disc for no reason. Or a paddle. I like the paddle. I love the paddle. But I think it's a terrible idea for a projectile. I think it's funny that he throws the giant fucking thing. I mean, it comes back to him, so why not? <laughs> sure, why not? Ah, cool's inherently amazing. Like, I have, I have a soft spot in my heart for people who throw giant swords. Just because it's such a fuck-it-we'll-do-it-live choice in combat <laughs> to throw a sword. <laughs> to be very fair about it, I mean... You do have both him and Kung Jin tossing around, like, discs and chakras, and... Sure, I guess. If you, if you had to take away one, fine. Take away the disc. So I guess we can answer some questions now to finish things up with. Yeah! It's been a while. We've actually had a have... little bit of a backlog developing. We do have quite a few questions. I mean, some of these are other people commenting on questions, so... Yes. Let's but, see. uh... Let's see. So, first... So... Battlesticks asks, I thought MK could thrive as an anime type of series. I'm a big fan of Dexter Soy's MKX run. I'd choose him as art director. Which artist would you choose to inspire the look of an MK anime? I am not so sure about a specific artist, but... Ever since I saw Kill Bill Volume 1, I really wanted production IG to do a anime. Mm. Well, didn't, I just um, I thought it was beautiful. Well, who did the animated and, uh... parts of the Katana Molina Legacy episode? Because that looked a lot like Kill Bill One to me. The if it Oren's was... backstory part. Let's see. I mean, it was a little. It, it looked cheaper and more motion comicy, but it looked like the same art style. Like for me, for me, that particular style is a little more stylized than I'd like to go. Like, there's a fisheye lens effect all the time. I would, um... I don't know if I would... I can think of a specific, um... anime artist who I'd want for Mortal Kombat, because... Uh, so many animes either look the same or are super stylized. And I would want something a little more traditionally Western in look. I don't know if I could pinpoint a specific animation that I'd be like, that's it, that's what MK should look like. The animated sequence in Legacy was developed by Sequence Post. I've never heard of them. Mm. Alright, well. Actually, you know what? I've, um... I mean, this is a pretty generic pick, probably, but I just... Cowboy Bebop is pretty good at, um... 
animating action scenes without becoming confusing for um, the Liu Kang scenes because they clearly know how to animate a guy imitating Bruce Lee. Because <laughs> Spike does Jeet Kune Do-ish stances and stuff in uh, Bebop. It is a series I've never gotten around to watching and everyone says I should. I mean, it's... It's 15 years old and it's still showing on Adult Swim, so... <laughs> This would help if I actually had TV and not Netflix. Maybe it's not Netflix. I'll check it out. Probably on Netflix. I don't know. Um. Yeah, I'm more of a I'm more of a fan of like a lot of older stuff like Bebop and Trigun. Um, I like JoJo, but JoJo is super stylized. I wouldn't want MK to look like that. JoJo is very much its own beast, and JoJo is. It's not something that would lend itself to adapting other works. And it's yeah. because of JoJo that we have half of the Street Fighter cast, so... Yeah. Um, I like... Right now, I'm watching My Hero Academia, but art-wise, it's pretty standard for anime. Like, I don't think anything visually stands out in that show. I just really like the premise. Apart from production IG for the uh, Kill Bill segment, I suppose I could also mention a couple of animes that I enjoy the look of viscerally. I mean, I'm a fan of uh, Helsing. Hmm? I like Helsing. Helsing's nice. I like um, I like Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood in particular because it's obviously the manga as opposed to making up its own stuff. Wouldn't uh, wouldn't give it Full Metal Alchemist's look. It's a bit, it's a bit rubbery. For MK, I don't know. Hmm. Eh, that's fair. I'm also big on Ninja Scroll. I mean, mm. Ninja Scroll is what it is. It's very much the entry level ultra violent yeah. anime. It's it's a uh, it's old. It's a classic. Wouldn't say no to an MK developed in that style. Uh, let's see. Next question. Um, Maxi asks. Or more comments. I always thought that Shang getting older in the MKR intro or the MKA intro. <laughs> I don't know why I said R. MKR uh, was because of Lou's hooks were tearing apart or something like that, not because of Blaze's roar at him. Um, that's that's a weird thought. I don't think Lou's zombie hooks were magic. I'm pretty sure. Like. I don't know that there is an explanation for why Shang suddenly turns old in that scene, other than the developers wanted to bookend the series and have, like, old Shang was the first villain. Let's end on a shot of Shang as an old man. Like, they thought it would be artsy or something. It's a very typical, oh, the villain is getting weaker moment, so... Yeah, like... Let's slowly deprive could... him of all of his power, and that's... I think that's open and shut. I don't think there was any any specific uh, thought behind that apart from... Like, it, uh, it, it could be that Blaze's roar has a magic property that's weakening him. It could be because Shang, in, in the story of MKA, has just come back from the dead low on souls, and so his power runs out faster. But I, I don't think it was the hooks. That seems weird. No. <laughs> It's just, he's getting the crap kicked out of him, let's show him as weak. That's all that there is to it. Sure. And, and, and I never saw Blaze as being remotely part of it. Well, it's just that it doesn't happen until Blaze starts roaring in his face. Meh. So it's like, but correlation is not necessarily causation, you know? <laughs> Alright, so, um, Evan K has a question that... I'm not going to answer right now. I'll save it for a future episode because it will require some thought. Are you actually going to do this? I I might give it an attempt. So what he asks is, uh, Razor once mentioned that the Lin Kuei clan ain't nothing to fuck with. I would like Razor to assign classic hip-hop songs, preferably East Coast, to Mortal Kombat characters. For example, fuck the Satan police. <laughs> I don't have anything prepared right now, off the top of my head. <laughs> well, I look forward to this. Alright, we'll 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 look into that for the next episode, maybe. So, the next question 
is one that I am... I've discussed before in various places, but I don't know I've ever done it on the air. So let's get to it. Uh, Smokeman asks, If Johnny Nightwolf and Shao Kahn can all draw from souls for their green energy, then how do you explain Jade's shadow kick? My answer to this is that Jade does not do a shadow kick. See, they started calling it the shadow kick in Deception and MK9, which are two of the games where they couldn't do shadows in the graphics. In MK Trilogy, Ultimate MK3 and Trilogy, which was the game that introduced Jade having her own moves and not using Katana's moves, the way her kick worked is that her entire body glowed green and smoking hot, and they called it the Blazing Nitro Kick. So there's never actually been a game where Jade had shadows or afterimages behind her when she did the kick. So Jade doesn't do a shadow kick. The end. I don't care what they call it in the moves list, it's not a shadow kick. I do think that there was a thoughtless attempt to retcon it so that she was doing the exact same thing as the rest of them were in the 3D games. Well, if she comes back in a game and there's actual shadows, then I will entertain the possibility. But until then, it's not a shadow kick. In fact, Katana has it in Mournful variation in X, and she does it by using the staff to pole vault into a kick. And I think that's how Jade should do it. I'm disappointed that she doesn't seem to glow green anymore. I never thought that initially she was doing the same thing that Johnny was. Not until a 3D. No, era. yeah, like... Well, here's the thing is, all the graphics, like, we've talked about this before, the special effects for special moves in the 3D engines never look as good as they did in sprite art. Like, now, when you make someone glow, there's it's the same effect on every character. It's just an aura around the edge of their body. Yeah. It was very homogenized like, and quite boring. Yeah. So, like, Jade's entire body should turn green, and she should be smoking hot when she delivers her kick. And they should call it the fucking Nitro Kick, not a Shadow Kick, because there's no shadows. So yeah. That's it. it right, shouldn't even so be that's the, all I got. It, it shouldn't it's, even be the same kick that... The, yeah, the same no. type of move that I mean, she, she slides that's across it. the ground and hits you with one foot, just like Johnny does. That doesn't make it the same kick. Think about it. Sindel's fireballs are purple. So are Jax's waves. They're not channeling the same thing. There are similarities, but they're not the same move. All right. So Reiko Suave asks, Why are souls green? Souls are green because it looks spooky. <laughs> the color green, especially like that pukey yellowish green, is, it looks putrid and evil. And it's like, in color theory, it's like how... A lot of mainstream superheroes wear primary colors, you know, red, blue, yellow... Superman and Wonder Woman, Captain America, Iron Man, Red, Spider-Man. Reds and blues and yellows are very common on heroes. Green, purple, and orange are very common on villains. And also, like, Slimer is green and Ghostbusters. Green is just... It's a color commonly associated with ghosts. I have my own theory about this, actually. Okay. We have established that uh, John Tobias comes from a comic background. Yeah. There is kind of a history in Marvel of the soul gem being green. And That's true. Soul like, world. in the movies, in the movies, yeah. time gem is green and soul gem is orange. But in the comics, the gems are mostly different colors yeah. than they are in the movies. One of the things that the soul gem can do is that... It can trap someone's soul within it, and then you get stuck in this place called Soul World, which is varying shades of green. And it wouldn't surprise me at all to learn that Tobias had that in mind when he started having Shang Tsung eat people's souls and they were colored green. So it's a long-running history in association with, at least in Marvel Comics, of green being the color of the soul. It's entirely possible. But... 
I mean, the the important qu thing about the question why are souls green is that are they always green? Because uh, Kenshi, who ostensibly also uses his ancestor souls, his powers and his astral images and his ancestor souls in possessed variation, well, his ancestor souls are like black and red. They're like evil spirits, but his normal powers are blue. And when Sindel gets Shang's powers in MK9 and she steals Kitana's soul, it's purple. And my argument to that would be that they fucking colored it wrong when Sindel did it. And that Kenshi's telekinesis is a little bit different than Souls to me. Like, yes, the power comes from Souls that are in the sword, but they're giving him psychic abilities. So he's not attacking you with Souls, he's attacking you with his own mind. So I'm fine with Kenshi using a different color, but it bothers me that Sindel was doing a fucking purple Soul Steal. Like, that's not okay. I would prefer if soul magic was presented as a consistent color. Remember when Shokan's bled different colors? I do remember that. I kind of miss it. Like I, I don't. I wouldn't I really I don't. wouldn't want I wouldn't want Shiva to bleed bright green, but like if it was like a really like dark almost black green, it would give them something more alien. Like it'd be a nice touch, but it's not something that I'm going to lose sleep over. I'm okay yeah, like with them I... all bleeding one shade. I'm, I, it, it actually bothered me that Shiva bled green. I figured that would be a reptile thing. Well, I don't know. I feel like it's actually too much green to have reptile bleed it because, like, I felt that way too. But I just, I'm like, you know what? I get the, I, I get the urge, the desire to give people different blood. You got cyborgs running around, and you want to show off your color palette a little bit. Fine, I get it. But it just... Kintaro I do and think... had already been bleeding red. Well, yeah, like, they'd already established, but... So it bugged me. That's all. But, like, if, if you were starting over from scratch, if you were rebooting and doing it right, I would not mind, like, if they put some thought into it. Like, actually, find out what color lizards bleed, you know? And that's what Reptile should bleed. Car to the Low asks us, In MK Armageddon, you could unlock the Elder God armor for your creative fighter. How would you feel if we got an Elder God as a playable character in MK11 wearing this armor, or would you prefer it as an alternate costume for Scorpion? Uh, I would prefer it not at all. That armor looked bad. Let me just go and refresh my memory as to what this thing it's, actually uh, it's, like. it's just, it's golden plate mail with, like, Thor wings on the helmet and a cape. And I'm pretty sure that's all it is. And I don't think it was supposed to be, like, or the armor of an Elder God. I think it was supposed to be, like, the armor of a champion of the Elder Gods. So, it would be more fitting for, like, a monster or scorpion or whoever the champion is in the new timeline. I just, I don't think it was a very good design. It was really uncreative. They can do better. And I think this should be consigned to the dustbin of generic fantasy armor. I don't want this back. It's boring. No. Sorry. It's, don't I mean, for it. if it was like a dull gray or a black, it would just look like a basic Dark Souls character, wouldn't it? It really would. There's nothing <laughs> about this that screams Mortal Kombat, so... I've said it before, I'm fine with having more Elder Gods or more Gods as characters. In fact, I don't think that we have enough. But I wouldn't want them to come back looking like this. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, we can do better. Um. Okay. Snake Eyes asks. Uh, this is a good question. If you were to draw out the MK cosmology and map out the realms, how would you go about it? Personally, I think it's similar to Yggdrasil from Norse Myth. And then um, Ishii Rose has a graphic of his own take on it, which is sort of a similar idea. Um, and Ishii's idea is fairly similar to how I see it. And what he drew is 
he put Earthrealm in the middle of like a big circle. And it is sort of like Yggdrasil in that Midgard is in the middle. And that makes sense because um, if you go back to Tobias' writing in MK1 and 2, he would occasionally refer to Earthrealm as the Mother Realm and say that the reason Shao Kahn needed Earthrealm in order to conquer the rest of the universe was because Earthrealm is sort of more connected to the other realms. Like, there's a lot of portals that just occur in nature, and it's easier to get... Like, we're a crossroads. It's easier to get other places from here. So, it is based... Earthrealm is Midgard in the MK universe. That's basically canon. Um, And then what you'd have is, like... And first of all, like, drawing a map doesn't necessarily make literal sense. Because, like, these aren't, these aren't planets out in space. You can't actually take a ship from Earth to Edenia. They're in other dimensions. This is, this is very much an abstract and metaphorical map you're talking about. If I had to actually put it to pen and paper... I think what I would present would have more in common with a spider web. A three dimensional spider web. It's hard to articulate what I'm saying, but like, Earth would be very much near or at the center of this, and then at the top of the web, you would have the heavens, then at the bottom, you would have the nether realm. But I wouldn't have them being on anywhere near close to the same level as each other. I put Outworld somewhere close by Earthrealm. This would be a 3D shape, not so much. Yeah. Well, yeah, like so. Not so first of all, I like would, yeah. you have you do have to imagine it in 3D because the heavens and the Nether Realm are on the Z axis. They're above and yeah. below all the other realms. Precisely. But then, if you imagine an X and Y axis, like so. Sado and Chaos Realm are on opposite sides of each other from Earth Realm. Because it's like, Earth is the most middle normal realm. And then over here is the realm of extreme, like, law. Like, it's practically a magic place where if you're born there, you're not necessarily, like, free-willed. You're almost, like, predisposed to being a lawful alignment character. And the same, but the opposite for Chaos Realm. And then, like, Edenia and Outworld, I also imagine as opposites on a line. Like, Edenia is like the realm of peace, and Outworld is the realm of war. You know what I mean? I do. And then... And then just sort of out in random places in space, you have all those other realms if they weren't merged to Outworld. Like, Zatera doesn't really have any kind of polar position. It's just out there. Uh, Vaternus is just out there. You know, um, Oshtek is just out there. That sort of thing. There's one additional factor that I would probably give this. And in this 3D web... Space would also probably be a factor, and I would probably have dividing sectors of this. I, I wouldn't. I would never have too many realms clustered closely together, but there would be places closer together than others. It's hard to articulate, but I'm trying to keep the fact in mind that all realms are essentially supposed to be part of the one being, and that they represent a divided entity of sorts. Well, so I'm, I'm thinking saying of, like... I wouldn't form a little stick man out of these things. At all. <laughs> period. But I would define space as a necessary factor. Well, to me... Web. To me, if you think about, like, how alternate dimensions work... So, I don't think, like, Edenia is an alternate Earth, but I think its location in its universe is over top Earth's location in its universe. Like, they're actually stacked. So, like, Outworld has... If you took a spaceship to Mars, and then you opened a portal to Outworld, you would be where Mars is in Outworld's universe. 
there might not be a planet there. You might be in empty space. Like, they probably don't have a Mars. But those location coordinates, like go somewhere like every realm has a universe around it like it's not just the planet it's the space around the planet yeah. too so like earth realm has a universe outworld has a universe you can't get there from here without portals it might work best to envision this as kind of a cross section of this 3d space or web to put it in no uncertain terms, yeah. no single depiction of all the realms is going to make sense looking at them as one. You have to have some yeah, sort of universal divider. You have to, you have, to have, like... I mean, it's not just 3D, but you also have to have, like... Imagine... Imagine you have, like, a pair of glasses, and there are, like, jeweler's lenses on the glasses... Yeah. So, like, when you're just wearing the glasses, you're looking at a map of Earth, and then you put down a lens, and it's a map of Outworld, and then you put down another lens, and it's an, a map of Edenia. Yeah, like, precisely. you can't all see them at the same time. So, yes, putting them all in one map is a simple prospect at best. It's, it's weird and fuzzy. <laughs> it's hard to do. But but I do I do want to like express the the sentiment that Earthrealm is Midgard, and that there is like a pole thing going on, like a like Sado and Chaos Realm are opposites on an axis, and I think Edenia and Outworld are also opposites on an axis, and the heavens and the Nether Realm are opposites on an axis. Maybe, I guess, for Ishii's map, you could, oh no, separate each of the center planets within the uh, circle by a series of lines and color all the backgrounds different colors. Right. Also, like, Ishii's map shows uh, the Nether Realm as having only five planes because the fifth plane of the Nether Realm is the highest number we've heard of. But I am dead certain it has nine, like Dante's Inferno. Probably. What if the last one's actually cold? <laughs> Wonder if that's where the cryomancers are. So, Their own special yeah. level of hell. <laughs> Consigned to the bin of history. B, B underscore Rad Brad 8899 asks, Is there a skin in either the MK or Injustice series at first that you hated, but later on started to come around to it more than more? Generally, no. My first impressions tend to remain my impressions forever on things. But I do rather like Injustice Scorpion, which is weird because it's a dumb and cartoony outfit. But what I like about it is that I feel like it does what MK9 Primary was trying to do better. Like, MK9 Primary just plain looks stupid. Like, the, the texture on the black parts just kind of doesn't make any sense or look like anything it's just ugly the flame designs on the yellow parts are simplistic and poorly designed like they, they're just jagged lines like you couldn't actually draw a flame come on the the curly scorpion tails on his shoulder pads are completely fucking bugs bunny it's just it's just gross and unappealing. The the fucking the way they designed the bug face part of his mask, like the part that covers his nose and mouth, doesn't look like anything. But the injustice version looks like someone had the same idea but can actually draw. <laughs> For me, the answer to that question is Melina's MK9 main. You didn't like that at first? I thought I, it was perfect. I did. I mean, it shows a lot of skin, so I kind of get it. This, but... this is the thing, though. She'd shown a little it's, bit of skin at first, but... It's it basically never... just her de deception alt over again. It felt a little bit... like It felt like a little bit more than that, though. 
The Alden Deception, I I never liked it either. I thought it was way too much. It was, and it just combined that with the character models at the time. It just looked terrible to me. Yeah, and it wasn't like, really until the Deception period started that Melina started getting kind of sexy. And you know what? I was like, okay, for for Deception, fine. It makes sense that the evil twin would be a little bit raunchier than the original good one. Fine. I, got I mean, no, my... I got no problem with that. But when MK9 first came along and they were all kind of dressing like harem girls, I hated it. Just straight up and down. I hated everything that I they mean, were all every, wearing. Every time, every time I complained about the character designs in 9, I always said, except Melina. I, Every time. Yeah, it took me a while to, to come to that conclusion, but I, I did too, eventually. Just, just, here's just here's my first, thing, is first, that, like, just hang on, you're just right just that they didn't, they didn't add the, the sluttiness to her character until the 3D era, but my commentary on that would be that she had no character in the 2D era, that Melina wasn't a character yet. Melina is actually... Before Deception, Melina was one of my least favorite characters in the franchise. Like, she was just Baraka with hair to me. She was an opportunist to me. And they kept that thread going strong. The, the and... Opportunist is not a character trait in Mortal hang Kombat. On, you just on. described the entire villain <laughs> roster. <laughs> to some extent. But she was, she was very much the kind of character who kind of sat back and served one master or another, then bided her time. And then they made that noob specialty years later. By the time she went I, from, like, being loyal to Khan to then being loyal to Shinnok... I can't then... really say that I would describe those times as her sitting back and waiting. Like, she was always very, like... doing whatever in the moment out of desperation. Because it's, like, it's very clear that she doesn't want to serve Shinnok, but she has to because she's afraid of him. And then it's like, she doesn't really wait in MK4. She just, as soon as she has the chance, she's like, fuck this, I'm after Katana. She did in MK2, though. It was all about, like, you she's, know... She's, in, she's more like impulsive I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, than that's waiting fair. her turn. But my point is just that she was always kind of there for her own ends. It was, it like, was obvious from part one. Yeah, but everyone's there for their own ends. Like, if you look at the trilogy roster, the I'm only not saying, person... I'm not saying that it made the, her special... I've always thought it is... was funny. I've always thought it was funny that if you look at the trilogy roster and you look at all of the people who work for Shao Kahn, which is most of the roster, like the bad guys outnumber the good guys, the only ones who would not betray Shao Kahn are Ermac and Motaro. Every single other person in his army is out for themselves. To me, Shao Kahn's court has always been like this just festering pool of vermin and each of them are out to like me number one yeah but so like, i'm not, I'm not saying that this that's, makes i'm not that's saying not a that character this... then if everybody's doing it like if everybody's special then nobody is <laughs> thing is thing is she had this before most of those people came along and made it their specialty i don't the way perceive I've time seen. that way like to me it's all the same period i've always looked at her as you know really wanting that throne really needing to have that throne. It's and I still whether I it's don't... through Baraka, I never ever saw her as essentially outgoing or slutty or whatever have you or overcompensating for what she thinks she's lacking until time and tides had passed. Because when MK9 came along, I lumped her in the same boat that I did with Katana and Jade as what the fuck are they all wearing? They all look like harem girls. And I hated it. And I didn't and I didn't look at that angle of her having something to prove, having an inferiority complex. I didn't look at her dress as being a symptom of her inferiority complex towards Katana until some time had passed. That's all I'm saying. Well, that's my answer. I mean, for me, I didn't think about like I didn't think about Melina that way until Deception and Shaolin Monks introduced it, because I didn't think about Melina. Like, the only thoughts I ever had about Melina is, 
Didn't this character die in two? Why did why do they keep coming back? Fucking stop it. But but then it was like, oh, this makes perfect sense. Now she has a personality and it fits her backstory. It's she's daddy issues the character. This all is coming together now. They gave her more as time went by of what I saw in her. But what I saw in her was never specifically crazy sex bimbo the character. It's a detail <laughs> that they added that they made work that wasn't there for me initially. So that's my I opinion. always thought that it was like the thing that brought her all together as a character. Like it, she finally made sense to me. But that's fine. Um, but yeah, so your answer is MK9 Molina's costume and my answer is Injustice Scorpion. There we go. Also, I'm not sure that as a child I appreciated Unmasked Sub-Zero. It took Deadly Alliance to make that outfit look good, and now it's my favorite outfit. I was all like, why is he white now? <laughs> I mean, at, I, I don't care anymore, but at the back of my mind, it bothered me for a while. I don't care anymore. I have established I, Sub-Zero I as being I don't kind think... of a... Uh... That didn't bother me because his bowl cut was ugly <laughs> in the MK2 ending. That's fair. And I'm I'm sorry, it's... Josh Tsui, that's your actual hair. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I thought I thought that um John Turk is a better looking guy, so I think we've firmly established at this point that like John Turk formed the visual basis for Sub Zero going forward and Yeah. Whatever one random picture of Josh Sui in the MK2 ending once showed us, it's gone now. Yeah. And I never really, like, I never really took it seriously as his face. Like, I was just like, okay, they have limited resources. This is the guy who played the part. But it's, like, to me, they didn't have their own faces until the 3D era when they were actually designing them in a computer as opposed to being forced to rely on the actor they have. All right. So Crispus Milk asks us, do we know how close Kano and Cabal are in terms of friendship? Well, MK9 story mode seems to imply that they were pretty buddy-buddy. They were, really, they, were uh, they were familiar. I don't know if they went out for rounds after an assassination mission or... No, I don't, I don't think Kano is the kind of guy who has, like friends the way normal people have friends, where you're actually close to them. I think he has people who he enjoys the company of. <laughs> he'll... Okay, I'll put it to you this way. I think that he'll go out drinking with any one of his Black Dragon comrades, but the second that they get too drunk and someone says something about Kano's mom, they get a knife in the gut. <laughs> yeah. Like, Kano is not the kind of guy who has options for a best man if he ever gets married. Kano is not the kind of guy who's like, if he was down on his luck, he has someone who will let him sleep on their couch. If Kano's down on his luck, someone's getting their throat slit ear to ear, and he's sleeping in your bed. Yeah. That's what's happening. I would define Kano and Cabal's relationship specifically as co-workers on first-name basis. That's about it. Sure. They've probably had some water cooler conversations, but that's about it. I think I think Kano is being genuine when he says that he like misses having him around, but that's about it. Yeah, you're good at what you do. You're useful to me. So all right, and the last Ragnarok one Flames asks, "I hate the conquest modes. Why should I not hate them?" So and that's uh, that's a long answer because there are multiple different conquest modes. <laughs> he, um, I asked for some detail on this, and he said, I just don't find the RPG format for MK to work well, and the beat up style could have been way better if they cared in the 3D era. Mostly I think they were executed poorly and didn't feel like there was much heart put into them. I bought the 3D era games again, and I'm playing the conquest stuff, I just can't get into it. Now, the problem I think you're having here is that you're looking at them as fully-fledged, realized games. And not side games in the way that you would look at chess combat or motor combat. These were never ever meant to be fully fleshed out games comparable to anything you would find on store shelves. 
They were just fun little side modes to primarily show us around the story mode. They're there to, you know, just show us the lay of the land and give us some nice places to visit and punch some people wearing balls. They're just... <laughs> they, that's it. They're tiny, glorified mini-games that just happen to pack a lot of story content in. And it's cool that you don't like them as games. I remember finding... Like, honestly, Shujinko's maneuverability is not particularly fun. It's, no, like, so... It's, it's like you're trying to, like, hold a wet hot dog. I realize that sounds filthy, but, like, <laughs> he's just really, really slippery to maneuver around with. So here's the thing. If we're talking about deception, then I actually agree with him. I've I've not... Like, I get what other people see in Conquest Mode, and I thought it was all right when I was playing it for the first time back in the day. But it's so... It so does not live up to its potential. Like, the idea of wandering around the realms and meeting the characters and talking to them would be great. Except they did not write interesting dialogue for most of the characters, which makes it kind of pointless. Running around the realms and exploring them would be great if the realms had more landmarks in them. Like, Earthrealm is kind of the most interesting place that we've already seen before. Like, Sado and Chaos Realm are the most interesting because we're seeing them for the first time, but Earthrealm has all the, like, places you'd expect to find in China in the MK universe. It has the Shaolin Temple, the Lin Kuei Temple, Liu Kang's tomb, uh, Bo Raicho's house. I Outworld think really... only has the Living Forest. That's it like there are so many places that would be so fucking smart to put on that map like well, we you arrive the, through a portal we got the picture and you're in the mountains well. and you're on like bridges why couldn't that have been the portal i think i believe the bridges were supposed to represent the pit two area yeah but they but don't you, look you, like you that at all have, like they don't it was an ultra they simplified version of it they're just they're just boring Rocky land bridge. Like, they could have designed these things to look like things. <laughs> and remember, at the time, even at the time, everyone was laughing about the fact that they basically hired five people for the price of a sandwich to come in and record all of the dialogue. So my point is... You can't, you can't say is... they hired people. Those people already worked there. <laughs> <laughs> Let me pretend that these people were paid with sandwiches. They planned <laughs> to put this that amount of effort in. I'm sure they were, I'm just saying they were already Midway employees, they were not voice actors. <laughs> yes. But, yeah, that's that's my contribution, is that they probably thought that they were giving us a lot to work with already. And, to be fair, they kind of were. For I a mean, side mode to a fighting game. A side mode. It was, I'm sure it was a lot of work to make it. Yeah. And there is some value there. It was a lot of it. It's just... But it's Such for, a missed opportunity. It's for lore heads like ourselves. I just... If you're going to visit Outworld, why would you not fill it with famous places in Outworld? That's all I'm saying. I That's think that, all I have. I think that, that if they had tried to do it, they probably would have wound up with an Outworld map twice as big as any of the other maps because there would just have been so much to fit in there. And I mean... Like, you go to Edenia... And you get to visit, like, it looks like Edenia, everything's all pretty and idyllic, and you go to the castle, which is really the only location in Edenia we know about story-wise, so it's there, like, they did it. We know so many places in Outworld, and we don't get to go to them. Like, you don't... Shao Kahn is standing in the middle of a generic camp, like, a place where his soldiers are, like, stationed. You don't go to Shao Kahn's castle... At least it was purple, right? It was. It was very purple. It was so purple. It was the purplest. Would we be angry yeah. about the purple today if, if if it had not been that purple? I would still be angry about the purple because it's purple in other things too. All right, that's fair. I'm just saying. But it that is that is the most purple it's ever been. Yes, it was purple everywhere. When I was the there, tomb. it felt like I was in Outworld. Like it, there wasn't famous places in Outworld, but it looked like Outworld. Like, that's what Outworld should look like. 
they might simply have not known how to like render a skybox that was purple in some places, purple like orange in others. Who knows? I just it, it might have technical limitations. But I'm not complaining they... about the purple in Deception. I'm complaining yeah. about the lack of it in X. That's fair. <laughs> I like the purple in Deception. That's what I'm talking about here. Is like that might be why we didn't get to like explore places like the Soul Tomb or the Portal in Deception's Conquest modes because Maybe. they might not have been able to give us everything that they knew that we were familiar with. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't have minded the color of the sky if the bridges looked like the pit. <laughs> It really was ultra simplified. There, was there is one more question at the very bottom here. Cartoon uh, below. Uh, yeah. Who are your top five characters that you feel should be in every Mortal Kombat game? And then he says, for me personally, it's Liu Kang, Sonya, Jade, Li Mei, and Blaze. Which, those are weird picks, but you know. I. Whatever you like, bro. <laughs> I won't disagree with Jade. I would always welcome Jade for every game. Um. So for me, I can't answer the question because I can't... There's not five. Like, see... Scorpion and Sub-Zero are the only characters I think should be in every game. Like, I can't say Liu Kang should be in every game because he wasn't in Deadly Alliance and it was really good. Uh, I can't say Raiden should be in every game because I'm sick of Raiden. I want him to start sitting out. I can't say Johnny Cage should be in every game because he hasn't been and some of those games were fine. Um, and also, like, the dude's just gonna get old and have to retire at some point, right? Like, I want character development. I want these guys to, like, grow and change. I would I would welcome a point where Johnny Cage is 65 years old and it would be weird to have him on the roster. So for me it's it's just Scorpion and Sub-Zero. Like maybe Katana, maybe Noob Cybot. But I can again, I can envision scenarios where those two characters sit out games and it's okay. So it's just Scorpion and Sub-Zero. I'm coming from most of the same place, because I believe that MK, unlike Street Fighter, doesn't have to rest comfortably on the laurels of everyone from MK1 or 2. So, there is not a single character, I think, that should be present in every single game. I would even be willing to have an MK game that didn't have Scorpion or Sub-Zero in it, although it would be fucking weird, and I'd probably hate the idea after a week of playing it. But I'd be willing to experiment with it. But I can give you five characters that I think should be in most Mortal Kombat games that should seldom take a break. Because there's very, very few people I would want to go away forever. And that's Scorpion, Sub-Zero, Johnny Cage... Shang Tsung. That's a fun, funny thing. I can't, I can't even say Smoke because Smoke doesn't belong in every single game. Neither does Noob, if you ask me. Ah, fuck it, Kato. I mean, I think, I think Noob belongs in most games. Like Katana, Liu Kang, Johnny Cage, um, Jax. But it's... Every game is... You know what? Okay, you know what? There's my number five. It's Jax. Jax should be in most games. Over Kano. There. I think I think since he's been introduced, Jax has been in every single game. If you count the PSP version of Deception. That's the only way, then yes. Because he wasn't in Deception normally. Yeah. Because before, the record holder was Bihan, but he's not in X. And also, he was only in the Game Boy version of Deadly Alliance. Yeah. It's one of the reasons I think that Jax should take a little bit of a break. But I normally don't hold that opinion. He's just been around forever now. Yeah, I just, again, for me it comes down to the move set. I need a WWE guy. Alright, well, I guess that does it for the night. Yep, that's, that's actually all of the questions. So, feel free to hit us up with some more. And until next time... 
Warren. We will continue our trend of covering characters who showed up in MK1 before we move on to anywhere else. So, if you're hoping for Katana or Kung Lao or Sindel or God help you, Chameleon, it's going to be a little while. So, as always, thank you for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. Stay strong with us as we continue the interminable wait for the game that we think exists. We're pretty sure it's in development. It's got to be 11 <laughs> sometime. Uh, maybe one day. One day soon, I hope. Good night, folks. Good night, everybody. <laughs>